tonight, uh, and I would invite you to open your Bibles with me to first, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. We're going to look at this in just a moment. You can go ahead and flip there now. We actually looked at it a couple weeks ago, but I want us to briefly look at it again. And tonight concludes, okay, what has been a 30-week lesson on the spiritual disciplines. I look back over it tonight. Actually, it's taken us over two years because we paused for different things. Uh, but uh, uh, 30 times we've spoken on the subject matter. Tonight, we're going to conclude this as we talk about perseverance in the disciplines and, and why I think this is so intricately connected, as we'll see in the scriptures, to uh, spiritual disciplines and what it means to follow Christ and the means God would use to make us holy and like himself. So I'll give to you a story uh, that is actually shared by W.A. Criswell, who was the longtime pastor of First Baptist of Dallas, Texas, and uh, just had a really incredible ministry there for, for many years. And he shares a story of an evangelist that he knew who was an avid uh, hunter, a, a, a bird hunter. And he had, he, he had gone and he had purchased uh, two dogs, uh, uh, top-notch bird dogs and two setters, and he was going to uh, raise them for hunting, and he was going to use them when he went hunting, and so he brought them into his backyard area that he had there, and he would let them kind of have a run in the lay of the land as they were growing, and he was teaching them. And one day, he and his wife noticed as they were sitting there looking out the window, as these dogs kind of had the run of the yard, here comes this bulldog. Okay, you know a bulldog, they, they got that wide walk on them, right? They, they, they uh, uh, walk kind of bow leg. And I got this mean look to him, right? Kind of like they own the neighborhood. That's exactly what this dog thought. And so he watched this bulldog crawl under their fence where these two setters were, okay? Much larger dogs. And initially what he thought was is, I better go get my dogs and put them in or get rid of the bulldog because they'll tear that bulldog apart, right? But he thought, well, I mean, really the best way to teach them a lesson to get out of the yard is just kind of let them, let them learn, learn what he needs to and so sure enough, those setter dogs, really because of the orderness of that bulldog, uh, they got into a scuffle. And sure enough, they whipped that bulldog pretty good. So he tucked his tail between his legs, what tail there was, and he, he crawled back on the fence, and they could hear him whining all the way down the street, licking his wounds as he left. He thought, well, that, that'll be the end of the story. The next day, sure enough, at the, around the same time, if that bulldog doesn't come back, crawls under that fence, and the same thing happens again. Listen, not only did it happen first day, the second day, it kept going every single day. You set your watch to it. This dog would show up, never seeming to learn his lesson. So, a few days later, the pastor, the evangelist, had to preach a revival. He would be out of town for several days. So he leaves, and uh, uh, he calls his wife. And several days, he asked, asking about different things. He asked how the dog's doing. She says, well, something you will not believe has happened with the dogs. He said, okay, what happened? He said, well, you know, she said, you know that bulldog? He keeps coming back. He said, yeah, still haven't learned his lesson yet. Every day. He came back again. Sure enough, it got to the point where, as of that very afternoon, she's speaking. He said, you know, those, our dogs, our center dogs, they heard that dog coming, right? They could hear him coming down the street. And finally, they got so tired, they just decided that they're going to be the ones to go inside. So both of those center dogs would run inside, go down to the basement, and now here's that bulldog walk around the backyard like he owns the place, all right? And the point is this, okay, with the bulldog, is perseverance. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark, right? All right? So the point is, is that perseverance is an important aspect, not just of life. I think most of us know that in our families, our jobs, uh, difficulties we face. But listen. It is an important point of our faith. Uh, why? Because for one reason, God calls us to persevere. Okay? In fact, the godly will persevere. It is critical for our faith. Those who do, not, who do not persevere in the faith, John says, we're never of the faith. Okay? So it's critical to our faith. It's critical to our very souls to persevere to the very end. But it's not just critical because God commands us to it, but it's also critical because God has promised it to us. This is what's wonderful about perseverance. God 
commands it of our lives, and yet he promises that he's going to be the one to make us persevere. That's because of his faithfulness that he will keep us to the end, those who are truly his. And so that's important for our faith, and it's very important for this idea of what we call the, the spiritual discipline. Now I want to remind you again as we close, okay? I'm speaking of those things that the Bible commands us to do, and most certainly there are more than we cover over 30 weeks, but I'm speaking of, of Bible intake, uh, whether it be memorization or, or reading God's Word, studying God's Word, listening to God's Word. I'm speaking of fellowship in the church, right? God's commanded us to this. I'm speaking of serving. God's commanded us to serve others, especially believers. I'm speaking of stewardship. God's commanded us to this. We're speaking of prayer and of fasting. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, drawing away from the world and, and, and uh, being near the Lord in devotion. Right? There's so many aspects of this we can talk about. These don't come naturally because they're disciplines. Okay? It doesn't come natural. It doesn't come easy. It's something you have to fight for and work toward. And yet they're spiritual because they're the means God has given for us to grow in grace, to become like Jesus. And in fact, if your life's like mine, and I know it is, okay, here's what your life is like. You can't squeeze one more thing into it. I bet that you don't have a paper thin place for one more activity. You've got so many, all of us do, right? Whether it's our, our children or grandchildren, or whether it's our job, or whether it's uh, financial responsibilities, or, or, or whether it's um, uh, other family responsibilities, or community responsibilities, that volunteer organizations we're a part of. Or then here comes the church and says, okay, we need you to serve in this capacity. And we have this event that's ongoing. And we need you to be here on a constant basis for different things. And now we pick up the Bible and it says, well, you know what? You also need to be doing at least 30 other things, right? 30 other things you need to add to your walk with Christ. And this is how you'll grow in your faith in Christ. And the question is, if our lives are already so full, how do we add one more thing? This is a struggle for me. And I know it is for you too, for all of us. How do we add more things? Something I found very interesting about the life of Jesus, especially as it is designated in the Gospel of Mark, the word immediately is used 36 times immediately, okay? That means, that gives for us a picture that Jesus was always, okay, a very hurried life. Jesus' life was very hurried. It was always immediate. It was immediately someone came and needed help. Immediately Jesus left the boat and went here. Immediately the storm arose. Immediately they needed Jesus' help. Immediately he commanded them to go and do this. Listen, it's always very immediate. So that Jesus had a very frantic ministry pace. There are occasions in the Gospels that tells us that Jesus ministered all day, all night, and even went without sleep. Right? There are occasions. We know he got tired. Let me tell you how tired he got. Right? The Bible tells us that he got so tired that he and his disciples got on a boat. And the boat was in such trouble because of the storm that the actual word that's used there, it says the water was swamping over the boat, okay? This little fishing boat. And Jesus was so tired, he was asleep in the bottom of the boat, right? I mean, sometimes we think, oh, it's because he was so peaceful. He, he was tired. He was asleep. Now, he was full of peace because he trusted his Father to care for him. And yet we see Jesus being tired um, uh, regardless of whatever our responsibilities are. The Gospels tell us that Jesus' responsibilities were greater, okay? He always had something, somebody pressing in on his time, didn't he? I mean, somebody always needing something from him. And Jesus, though he was very frantic in his pace, was never broken in his obedience to his Father and also was clearly able to keep the spiritual disciplines, okay? Even in his humanity. Jesus, completely human, just as much as he is completely God. And so he teaches us how to do so, but also we see how much he relied on these things. So how much more do we need to do that? Listen, we need to be practicing the disciplines because this is the means by which we grow uh, in godliness. Now, just because you're busy doesn't mean you're godly. Okay? We can be very busy with ungodly activities and even look like we're godly and still be ungodly. 
But I do believe that godly people are busy. And here's why. Because godly people have a singular love for God, which means that they have an expressive love for people. That means you're going to be a pretty busy person. That means you're serving all the time. It means you're doing things in your faith a lot all the time. And so busyness doesn't equal godliness, but godliness, I believe, always equates to busyness. We're very busy people, and yet the disciplines are that thing that makes us godly. So we've got to persevere in it, okay? Uh, so when my series on the spiritual disciplines is long forgotten, like, maybe by tomorrow, okay? And and when your fervor and zeal for doing something you heard, okay, begins to flame out because life gets real crazy and busy, what is going to keep us persevering and growing in godliness through the spiritual disciplines? I think perseverance is what's needed. Now, I ask you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, and we looked at this. Uh, actually, a couple weeks ago, we studied this passage. Um, but I want to show it to you. It's Philippians uh, chapter 2 and 12. And this is what Paul writes here again that I'll remind you. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says... You guys need to practice the spiritual This This is how you work out your faith, okay? But what I find really interesting is he says, you did it when I was your pastor. You did it when I was visiting with you and teaching you and there with you in your presence. Paul's not with him anymore. He says, do it more now that I'm gone, right? Persevere even more. So it's not just for Sundays. It's not just when we're going through the series. It is for our entire lives that we are to practice these disciplines in ever-increasing measure. We're to work out our salvation, a salvation that is the gift of God, and yet in which we partner through faith and obedience. So here are a couple of things I want to give you now as to how you persevere, okay, that are uh, what the scriptures tell us as to how we persevere in any matter of faith, but especially the spiritual disciplines. The first is I think we cannot look, overlook the role of the Holy Spirit, okay, the role of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see these. John, you pull this up. So persevering spiritual disciplines, the first step is to understand the role of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to John 14 and look at, start in verse 15. John 14, the Gospel of John 14, and look at verse 15 here. Uh, John 14 and John 16 has some of the greatest information, particularly from the lips of Jesus, regarding the role of the Holy Spirit okay, in our lives. So John chapter 14 and look there at verse 15 and I want to read down to verse 21 so here's what here's what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit he says if you love me you'll keep my commandments and I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Uh, now go down to verse 26. Note what else he says. He says, but the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now, go to John chapter 16 and look at verse 13. John 16, verse 13. <clears throat> Jesus goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13, he says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus cannot overemphasize enough the importance of the role of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life as followers of Jesus. He lives in us at the moment of faith. He reminds us of the truth. He guides us in wisdom. 
right? He makes us holy. He makes much of Jesus, right? He reminds us of his teaching. He gives us understanding. He's called the helper or the comforter, right? He, he not only comforts us in difficulty, but he also helps us and guides us through every circumstance. Listen, we are helpless and hopeless without the Holy Spirit, and yet if we know Christ, he's all ours. And, and we don't need any more of it. We, there's no more of him we can get. He needs more of us, okay? But we can't, we can't get any more of him. At the moment of faith, we have all of him. Now, there's a lot of mystery to the Holy Spirit, which, quite frankly, is why we don't talk about him so much. He's a little bit scary. It's a little bit out of control sometimes when we think about his ministry. But I want to show you, or at least tell you, of four things, at least, that you can understand for certain. One is this. He lives in believers. Okay? The Holy Spirit lives inside of the believer. <clears throat> I, I cannot Listen, whether, whether it's a child or whether it's a seasoned adult, does not matter. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It's not your conscience, okay, even though he speaks to the conscience. The Holy Spirit is the living God inside of you. Mm -hmm. Cannot express that enough, okay? And so he does live within believers. Second thing is he makes much of Christ. This is the ministry and role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's what Jesus said when he taught his disciples. He said, uh, he's going to give you what I give you. He's going to say everything that, that I say, everything the Father gives. He's always pointing to Jesus. Third thing is he works in us to make us more like Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's job to make you like Jesus. Okay? He will. He'll do it. He's God. He'll, he'll, he'll do what he's designed to do. Okay? Uh, what, what he desires and designs to do. And then fourth thing, we must not harden our hearts to his work. So the Holy Spirit's going to make us holy, going to make us like Christ. But you do have a role to play. So you can harden your heart. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You could ignore his conviction. I believe, even as a believer, that you could harden your heart to a point where uh, God would essentially say, there's nothing else that can be done with you. I'm just going to bring you on home. Uh, I believe that, that, that we can so deny him in our lives that we render his work useless. It doesn't mean he can at any point in time overpower us by his grace. But that being stated, we do get to participate by obeying him, by surrendering to him. By trusting him, okay? Uh, I want to show you uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You can turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And this is a, a pretty familiar verse, I think, to a lot of us. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. And note what Paul says here. He says, For God gave us a spirit, he's speaking here of the Holy Spirit, a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Other, you may have a version that says self-discipline. It's the same term here, okay? The Holy Spirit's the one that disciplines us. He's going to keep you disciplining yourself. He's going to lead you. Listen, when you don't want to read the Bible, he's going to lead you to read the Bible. When you don't want to pray, he's going to lead you to pray. When you don't want to be at church, he's going to convict you to go to church. When you don't want to serve, He's going to work through you to make you serve. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. He does it mysteriously. I really like this quote that comes from A.W. Tozer on the Holy Spirit. I think it gives a great illustration. I want to share it with you just behind me. This is what he says. One quality belonging to the Holy Spirit of great importance to every seeking heart is penetrability. He can penetrate matter such as the human body. He can penetrate mind. He can penetrate another spirit, such as the human spirit. He can invade the human heart and make room for himself without expelling anything else essentially human. The integrity of the human personality remains unimpaired. Only moral evil is forced to withdraw. The metaphysical problem involved here can no more be avoided than it can be solved. How can one personality enter another? The candid reply would be simply that we do not know. But a mere approach to an understanding may be a simple analogy borrowed from the old devotional writers of several hundred years ago. We place a piece of iron in a fire and blow up the coals. At first, we have two distinct substances, iron and fire. When we insert the iron in the fire, we achieve the penetration of the fire by the iron. Soon the fire begins to penetrate the iron, and we have not only the iron in the fire, but the fire in the iron as well. 
They are two distinct substances, but they have commingled and interpenetrated to a point where the two have become one. Listen, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, and, and, and literally, he, he comes inside of us to, to make us one with Jesus in every way. And Jesus said he'll do that. He'll do it. So you cannot underestimate the work of the Holy Spirit. He will finish the work he started. Philippians 1 6 tells us God who started this good work in you will bring it to completion, right? It's going to happen. But until then, it's our responsibility to submit every day as he speaks to us through his word, submit to him, especially in the discipline. So, how are you going to persevere? Well, one is the Holy Spirit is going to make you persevere as you trust him. Second thing is, I want you to see the role of fellowship. When I speak of fellowship, I'm talking about the church, okay? Because we're commanded to it. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. And, and I think this is, uh, boy, this is just such a, 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 a an expressive passage about the fellowship of the church. You're going to see why. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, and look at the first four verses there, okay? 1 John 1 and the first four verses. So, John writes, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, we've seen it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Pause there for a minute. He's talking about Jesus, right? He's saying, listen, I sat with the guy. I had meals with him. We we touched him, okay? We we were right there in the same proximity. We listened to him. We saw him with our eyes. Jesus is not this mystical force or some idea that we created. He is as real as the ground we're standing on, even more so. He says, we're going to tell you about him. That's, that's the message which he's given. And now, this is what he says. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, that you too may have fellowship with us. What does he say? He says, listen, I want to tell you about Jesus so that we can have fellowship together. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is what he says. We can't have fellowship without Jesus. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have fellowship. They're, they're one and the same, right? If there's no Jesus, there's no fellowship. If there's no fellowship, there's no Jesus. God did not call us to be Lone Ranger Christians. In fact, you can't know Christ all by yourself. Now, that does not mean that my relationship with God is not personal, nor should it be. It is a personal relationship with God, a personal decision I must make. But if I'm not in the body of believers in a local fellowship like this one, then that means I'm not ever going to grow in that faith. In fact, I'm not connected with Christ at all because they're so intricately connected to each other, right? To have fellowship with other believers. These two are so intricately connected is what Paul is saying. Now, that should be obvious, you would think, right? But but it's not so obvious in our day as has always been the case. Uh, listen, you can't practice serving if you're not in a local church. Who are you going to serve, right? I mean, you, you can't serve other believers if you're not around other believers. You can't practice pu public worship all by yourself. Can't be done. You have to be around other believers, okay? You can't have corporate prayer, which the Bible tells us to do, if there's not any other Christians to pray with. So these are parts of it. But also there's other things, right? The scriptures tell us that if we study the word with other people, that there's an effectiveness there that's not there if I'm by myself studying, right? And there's, there's angles of it I can understand more and things I can grow from and other ways that we see. I think there are two sins in today's culture that endanger proper fellowship with other believers. And they've really always been in existence, but, but now we find them uh, prevalently displayed, okay, prominently displayed. The first is, I think, what, I, what we could call digital connectivity, okay? Now, that sounds like that would be a great thing to be connected. Here's the problem that we see, though, is that oftentimes we're replacing physical touch with a digital touch which could be dangerous. Um, I read a story to give you an example. I read a story about this elderly woman, and she would go every week to the post office to buy a book of stamps, okay? And so she'd go to the office to buy a book of stamps. Well, the, the, the local office there, which was in, in a, a larger community, put in one of those machines, right? 
uh, put in a, mach a stamp machine. Now you didn't have to go wait in line. You could go and, and you put your, your dollars, quarters, whatever the case is, in the machine, and it would spit back out the books. And yet she chose never to use that. She would stand in this long line of people and wait to buy her book of stamps. And one of the workers there noticed what she was doing, and finally when she, she asked her, Have you, let me tell you about our, our stamp machine. It'll save you time, right? And she said, uh, well, no, don't want, I'm against it. She didn't want to hear about it. So well, can, I just don't understand what, what is, can you not figure out how to work a machine? She said, well, if I use that machine, who's going to ask me about my arthritis? Right? <laughs> now, listen, that's an important point because machines don't care about your arthritis, that's right? right? And, and now, again, that doesn't mean we don't be connected digitally, okay? Obviously, there's, there's much benefit to uh, uh, to all kinds of social outlets and ways that we can stay connected with other people. And we see the benefits of that, uh, that we can connect with people on a wide scale. Listen, I'm very thankful for the ability to be able to broadcast a service online. I'm very thankful that, that in a time in which we couldn't meet together, we still had a way to stay connected with each other. But, but that's not what we're designed for forever, right? That's why we're meeting, right? Because it's important for us to be together. Listen, shaking hands and hugging necks and, and being in close proximity. Listen, those are important factors, okay? And so all these things, we have to be very careful. And listen, even in an, at a time in which we're being told it's safer just to stay away, and I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. Please hear me, okay? I'm not saying that. But I am saying we have to be very careful that we don't ignore what is a clear principle of Scripture and of the human makeup. And that is that we need each other. We need to be close together, okay, in a safe way, but we need to be close. And so that being stated, that can really hurt our fellowship. John spoke of what he saw, what he touched, what he heard, okay? Another danger, and I think probably this is more, much more prominent, is what I would call Christian socializing, Okay? And it's what we do every time when we gather. Now, I don't mean we shouldn't, shouldn't socialize. I enjoy it very much, right? Talking about what's going on, talking about, it seems to be now it's all politics, and it's all, uh, you know, what's going on with this or that, or it's, you know, we're talking about sports, or we're talking about shopping, or we're talking about whatever. Listen, there's nothing wrong with it. That's an important aspect of fellowship. However, that being the case, too often, our conversations, even in church, revolve about everything except Christ. We never have spiritual conversations. I don't mean that we, every time we speak, should be quoting Bible verses, okay? But I mean there ought to be some kind of spiritual content to our conversations with each other. More than just a, hey, how you doing, and goodbye. Sometimes that's all we can do. But, but there ought to be more to that. Sometimes we can go to church or go to an event for weeks on end and never have a spiritual conversation, right, with another person. And so uh, the Bible tells us that we're to have fellowship. That's what fellowship is not just simply being close to each other. It is encouraging each other in Christ. And that's through our conversations and through listening. I'm going to show you uh, very quickly. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. And look through there at verse 15. Ephesians 4, 15, as Paul describes this, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We're a body, and we're to build each other up. And you cannot underplay the role of fellowship for your Christian faith and persevering. You know the person who falls away quickly from their faith is the person that pulls away from the body of Christ. And they go off by themselves. And they may be very spiritual, but there's no reality in their faith. And so it's in the fellowship of the body that we find this grace to continue. It's a spiritual danger not to do so. Okay, one more thing that's going to help us persevere. And this one seems the oddest of all to me. It is the role of struggle, okay? The role of struggle. Uh, note this quote that came from William Batten. He was one time the CEO of J.C. Penney, okay, which was once a hopping place. 
and the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange for more than a decade. Listen to what he says. When I hear my friends say they hope their children don't have to experience the hardships they went through, I don't agree. Those hardships made us what we are. You can be disadvantaged in many ways, and one way may be not having had to struggle. Right, this was a man who fought in World War II, and so he knew something of struggle and of deprivation. Okay? And he said it made it, right? And so I understand I don't want my kids to have to suffer. Who does want their kids to suffer? But the fact is that suffering has been more valued in my life than almost any other thing. And so even for my children, that is also the case to not keep them from that. We all are looking forward to the day when in glory we're not going to be sick, we're not going to be sad, we're not going to be uh, tempted, we're not going to struggle with sin. Listen, I want that. I want it with all my heart, okay? But the fact is it's not here yet for me. So that means God intends for me to struggle because we're going to struggle. As long as we're in this life, we're going to struggle with the world, we're going to struggle with the flesh, we're going to struggle with Satan. We're going to be in a constant struggle. That's the picture that is painted in the scripture, and God has a reason for it, right? Um, note what J.I. Packer writes about this. You'll see behind me. He says this. So we must remember that any idea of getting beyond conflict, outward or inward, in our personal or in our pursuit of holiness in this world is an escapist dream that can only have disillusioning and demoralizing effects on us as waking experience daily disproves it. We must realize rather is, is that, what we must realize is that any real holiness in us will be under hostile fire all the time, just as the Lord's was. We have to fight to be holy, and the struggle is a part of it, okay? And so we struggle against it. It'll actually help us to persevere. The struggle will. Read to you one last verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews was writing to a group of people who were beginning to experience some persecution, but it wasn't very severe, okay? There, there weren't people dying, okay, on the scene. It was, they were losing property. They were losing reputation in the community. Okay, I would say it's almost akin to what we're seeing with the church in America right now. We're, we're not being thrown into prisons, okay, but there is some low-level persecution we're beginning to experience, okay? And so he writes this passage to them, verse 3 and 4 of Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. This is what he says. He says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. He's talking about Jesus. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, Okay? All right, you want the, the actual Greek translation of that second part of that verse? This is it. Suck it up, buttercup. Okay, that's what he's saying. All right? It's a very loose Greek translation. But that's what he's saying. Okay? He's saying, listen, nobody is dead yet. Okay? Jesus died for you. Nobody shed any blood here. I know things are getting hard. I know it's getting a little bit tougher. But you can make it. You can make it. Okay? Keep your eyes on Christ. You can make it. You can persevere. There is something to be learned here in this context and an understanding. Christ keeps us. Okay? Uh, I'll close with this because I actually opened with it, which you probably don't remember, and uh, some of you weren't, weren't even here, okay? But 30 lessons ago on this, teachings ago, I started with this uh, illustration. Right? Uh, a few, it's been now a couple of years ago, Josiah and I were watching television, we were watching uh, sports. And we saw this um, uh, documentary on Pistol Peak Marriage. Some of you know who Pistol Peak Marriage is. I can remember my dad talking about Pistol Peak when I was little. He, he died several years ago when I was just a teenager. But, but, so I never got to see him play in person, but I've seen old clips. And I heard dad talk about it. He's the most amazing player to ever play the game of basketball. Right? He could do things that at the time was absolutely unheard of. Passing the ball, shooting the ball, uh, just out of of our minds and scoring and all these things. And he was unstoppable on the court. We saw that. And he shared that the secret to his freedom on the court, okay, it was like this seamless freedom with the ball. The secret to his freedom was practice. That's what he said. Just because I practiced. He would practice as a child, some because of the beheading of his dad, okay, but, but much because he wanted to. Eight hours a day, every single day in the gym. Right? Well into the night. He practiced, 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 practiced. And he said that was the key 
to everything in, in, in growing in his ability with a basketball. Now I want you to note what he said because he became a believer late in life and then he died not long after that. Lord completely changed his life. Note what he says here. You'll see it behind me. He says, the key to my ability was repetition. I practiced and practiced and practiced again. I gave the sport my total commitment. I tried everything I could in every way I could to perfect my skills. It was like an obsession. It paid off for me as a player. I'm not so sure in life. If I had given that same devotion then to my faith, which is what I do now, I'd have been a better person in the long run. Listen, the Lord changed his life. And yet he, he himself said how much different it could have been if I had started sooner. So when do you start with the spiritual disciplines? Now, right? You just, you just don't have more time to waste of reading the scriptures and praying and fasting and serving and stewardship and pulling away with the Lord and journaling, right? These are things that help us grow in our faith. And we don't want to be like pistol feet and look back and say, I gave myself to so many pursuits, but not the most important things. Now we can do that. Will we persevere? By God's grace, we must. Okay, we must. So I want to encourage you in that. Uh, let me close us as I pray tonight for you. And I will share with you that next week we'll start a series uh, now that will last for probably several more weeks. But I call it the 99 Essentials. Okay, I'm gonna, I want to share with you 99 doctrines of Scripture that I think every, every, every believer ought to know. Just some things you ought to understand about the Bible. I think, I think it's more critical now than ever before. It informs the decisions we make and the way we live. So we're going to start that next week. And uh, uh, so we'll be getting in that together. So let me pray for us tonight, and then we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for your word and encouragement to us tonight. That not only do you call us to discipline, but in fact, you're the one who does it in us. Holy Spirit, you come to live inside of us to make us holy. And you're going to finish the work. It's, it is complete process in you. And yet, God, we are called to faithfulness. We cannot, we must not slack in this pursuit. Lord, you call us to faithfulness. Help us to be faithful. Lord, I, I know that I'm not, nor is any of us where we ought to be. But tomorrow, I want to be more where I should be. And so I want to practice these disciplines that are so unnatural, because Jesus, I want to be like you. I really do. And I'm praying that for your people. God, in fact, that is the prayer that I would most pray for your people. Not that you would remove pain or God take away struggles or give guidance in this area or that, but even more, that Jesus, we would be a congregation of people that are just like Jesus, just like you. I mean, what greater thing could possibly occur? And I thank you that the day is going to come when we will be, when we stand in your presence. But let it find fulfillment even now, every day, as we follow you more. Oh, we need you to do it. It only comes by your grace. It only comes by your power. But we want to partner with you as we trust you and as we obey. Thank you again, Lord, for your truth and the hope within us because of the promise of eternal life. We love you and thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. See you this weekend. <laughs>